Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I've got Brian Robinson with us, and the topic of the day is the selling formula, five steps for instant sales improvement. Brian, for those of you who haven't heard of him, uh, Brian's a sales and marketing expert. He's a best-selling author and he's a sales coach. He's worked to, for some of the best-known companies in the world, Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson. Upon leaving his corporate career, he, uh, he helped launch a successful startup where he was the first person in the history of that industry to sell more than a million dollars of business in 12 months. He has over two decades of both face-to-face -face and phone presentation experience that can really benefit anyone in, uh, in, the, in sales from Fortune 500 companies all the way to small entrepreneurial ventures. Uh, Brian's got a author of uh, Amazon, Amazon number one uh, bestseller. It's called The Selling Formula, Five Steps for Instant Sales Improvement which will talk about some of the, the key takeaways from that book today. So first of all, Brian, what motivated you to write your book, The Selling Formula? I discovered um, over the years, as I sat down one day, I do a lot of journaling just to kind of gather my thoughts. And I recognized as I thought about my selling process that over the past 10, 15 plus years, I've been using essentially the same process every time I approach a potential client or prospect or customer. And if I could help other salespeople overcome the same speed bumps that I hit and issues by putting that and kind of codifying it in a book, um, that was my goal is to make this really a book you can put in the glove compartment of your car and your backpack. And if you've got a challenge with a specific part of the sales process, pull the book out, review the chapter. There should be something specific you can grab, walk into your next sales call with, and hopefully um, see a benefit right away. That was my goal. Awesome. Uh, I think it's such a fantastic uh, goal to help enable salespeople because that enables the revenue of a business, which is really the lifeblood of a business. It pays for all the things, you know, all the other parts of the organization, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so it's really, I, I think, a noble cause to to uh, enable sales in an organization. So tell me, uh, what are the five steps in the book? Tell us, uh, tell us about what selling formula, what the selling formula is, and and how our outside salespeople who listen to this show should use it. The five steps are, first of all, connect and set the agenda. Second is the interview process. Third is presenting your solution. Fourth is your pricing and guarantees. And then finally, closing the sale. And although this is not a brand new idea with respect to those concepts, the way that I've put it together, um, I found that if you follow this process, use it as a framework, and <clears throat> you'll, you'll see a potentially dramatic improvement in your sales process. And so that's, those are the five steps very simply. In terms of implementation, the um, probably one of the critical components I discovered is the interview questions. Um, and that to me has been the crux of any great salesperson's ability to catapult themselves to the next level is the questions you ask, becoming utterly fascinated with your prospect mm. and digging deeper than you might normally think you should. Uh, for example, um, when I was with Johnson & Johnson, we had a competitor that was very entrenched in a particular space. It was a product that helped um, when people had a hernia and they repaired it through the abdomen through laparoscopy. Anyway, they were entrenched. We came out with a competing product. Ours was clinically superior. And so I decided to throw myself into building questions around that to unseat our competitor. I spent hours creating these questions and it wound up being about 10 or so questions. 
and we only have a few minutes at the scrub sink to grab the surgeon and give an opportunity for us to come in with them to the procedure. And so I started asking these questions. And what I found is the order I ask them and the way I ask the questions literally changed the amount of trials that I got. It doubled my trials and of course doubled my sales as a result. And I started doing this with each product introduction and other people started to hear about these, this list of questions. Well, when they got the list and used it and followed it exactly, their sales doubled as well. And so it just revealed to me the questions were the absolute crux, kind of the um, big doors turn on small hinges. So these were the hinges that caused the big doors to open the questions. So, so what were, I, I guess, abstractly, not specific to lath lathroscopic mm -hmm. surgery, but what were the questions and what, what was the setup there? How, how, how was the, what was the formula to those questions? What I did was uh, created a, a T chart and I put features, benefits, and then questions. And actually three, three columns. And I was exhaustive in listing out the top features. And generally there'd be two, three, four benefits related to each feature. I listed those out. And then there would generally be multiple questions related to those benefits. And I collated those from general to specific, the questions based on the flow that I felt were the highest priority questions to ask, kind of an 80-20 approach. And that was kind of the flow that worked really well for building out those questions. Okay. So let's just pretend that we're selling, uh, um, let's, pull, let's pull it into a different industry. Let, let's just say something everyone understands. We're selling beer to bars. Uh, <laughs> Let's, let's build a list of, how, how would you go about building a list of this question if you were a sales rep for a microbrewery and your goal is to, uh, you, you know, you, your territory is a, a major city in the United States, let's just say it's, uh, it's Houston, and your, mm -hmm. your job is to, is to sell, sell beer into, into the bars in Houston, uh, you know, kegs of beers, bottles of beers, whatever. What, 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 uh, how would you go about building out the questions that you're going to present to the, the manager of the bar that, uh, that, that is your decision maker and buyer? First thing I would do is look at my particular beer and compare it to what's typically in the space that I'm competing in and decide through that research, where am I going to be head and shoulders above potentially my competitors? Based on that, I would look at the features that these bartenders or owners are comparing in order to decide what beer they're going to put in play in their bar. And based upon that, then I would create a feature list of those particular components. Then I would look at the benefits related to those specific features. And then I'd be very clear about the questions that I would ask to elicit those benefits that would most resonate with that particular owner or bartender. Okay, well, let's, let's pretend that you're selling a, uh, an organic beer that's uh, made with all natural ingredients and it's uh, extremely smooth and uh, so people can, people really enjoy it. I, I'm trying to think of another beer feature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but or, organic and, uh, and all natural ingredients, I, I guess is the key. So how, how do you develop questions that you would ask a, a bar manager or decision maker that would, that would help you sell that? Well, um, I, would, I would first dive into what organic actually means to my target. And that could be certain specific items that are put into the beer um, and find out if those are actually critical to that decision. Some may not be. Some may be just uh, meh, who cares about that? Mm -hmm. And do a little research to figure out that and then um, I just made a few notes here, organic, uh, smooth taste, and yeah, so I would, I would start out with those, those features mm -hmm. and then figure out uh, with those features, which one were probably the most critical, top two or three, and then associate the benefits of those organic properties, those organic ingredients, and what types of benefits are the drinkers getting out of that? How is that helping? Is that a, I, th I think about the beer that has very few calories, um, that Michelob light, for example, mm -hmm. I think that's what it's called or ultra. 
And, you know, does it compete with Michelob Ultra? If it does, uh, and it, it's organic, there's an advantage here. Mm -hmm. So you kind of elicit, you want to create questions that relate to the benefits tied to that direct competitor. And um, that's the kind of the process I would follow. Does that help? Yeah, it's so like a question. I'm trying to get the actual question to give an example. So like the question would be like, do you have customers that that uh, are vegetarian or mm. you know focus their their diet on eating all organic products? Um, it, it, in the end, and I guess the the bar manager is like, well, yes or no, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, or you know, do you have a lot of you know? you know, women who are between the ages of 25 and 35, you know, that 15% of them prefer organic products or 40% of them prefer organic products. So you, do you have a lot of people in that demographic? Perfect. And that's, those would be the general questions I would ask up front, of course, to determine if what their demographic is already, mm -hmm. and then see if the benefits would associate that. How important would it be to have an organic version of this? And if you did, what type of ingredients do you think would be most important to promote as a bartender in your business? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about some of the other steps. Uh, I guess I'd love to run through the five steps. There's two, there's two people that are listening to this podcast, two types of people. One, someone who has heard this and like, I got to go out and read this book right now. And two, people who are like, well, I haven't read a book in five years. Uh, I love YouTube though, but I would love, I would love if you would teach me the basics of what's in this book. So can you, let's go through sure. each of the five steps and like, and, and kind of flesh out with, you know, a couple sentences on each one to like sure. describe, describe so, what it is so that people can actually apply it to their own sales role. Okay. So the first step being connect and set agenda. Uh, it, it's critical in that first step to actually have a pre-call mindset that is focused primarily on the prospect. I think salespeople stumble very often because they're so self-focused. They're so wanting the deal to go their way. They forget that the other person they're going, to, they're going to speak to is very concerned about what they need. That's really all they care about. Mm -hmm. And so I recommend that you have uh, in part of your pre-call mindset that you actually start thinking about how much you like and care about that prospect before you ever call them before you ever walk in the door. Uh, it, you've got to get yourself into that mental state where no matter what that individual is like, you will like and care about them. The second mm. sub part of that first step is setting an agenda. And this may seem trivial, but I discovered that if you walk into a sales conversation, you, at, you indicate that you have an agenda you'd like to share with your prospect. Is that okay with them? an agenda for the conversation. It is amazing how that brings a, actually a level of peace to the conversation because they know you know where you're going. And it actually can bring an entire room full of people to attention. I discovered in board meetings and so on, when you say, well, here's the agenda for our conversation. And uh, it just brings also a higher level of authority, I think, to, to you as a salesperson. So the second piece is interview questions. And we touched on that. That's, a, again, a critical component and probably the most important in my view. Third is, and part of that interview process dives into the third piece, which is taking really, really good notes on the answers to the questions that you get from your prospect. And the reason for that is when you're taking notes, it allows you to actually quote specific words and phrases, of course, that your prospect may use. And then you feed those words and phrases back when you present your solution. And it, most people take ownership of what they've already stated. So what you've done is put yourself in a position to basically get over on the same side of the desk as your prospect and you're agreeing with them and you're talking to them in their own language. And that just creates another dynamic and rapport and also reinforces the fact that you care and that you've really truly listened to them. And that has a dramatic impact on a lot of people. And then the fourth step is your pricing and guarantees. And so what I've discovered, and this isn't apropos to every single product or service, of course, but um, instead of one price or maybe two, I found in the space that I've worked in over the years, having three price points can make a really big difference on the ability to close deals. 
And so people tend to like uh, a range of choices, but not too many. And three seems to be kind of the magic number. And also there's a concept of anchoring where if you give somebody a high price, a middle price and a low, they anchor the high and low and tend to go in the middle. Mm -hmm. And so that works really can work for you if it's done properly. And then the guarantees is all things being equal. I've discovered whoever's got the best guarantee will generally close the deal. Uh, for example, I consulted with a company that sold software to banks and credit unions several years ago, and they were essentially the same as every other player in that space. But I asked, is there anybody that has a guarantee on how quickly they can pull the content up and utilize it? For example, in less than 50 minutes, you can have all the content you need for an audit, et cetera, et cetera. So we put together four guarantees and I had them lead with those four guarantees before they ever talked about their product or service. They focused on the key main pain points that these prospects had and their, their sales doubled because they immediately honed in on the guarantee that would, that would make the most sense for these particular prospects. And the final point of course is closing and closing. Most people, tend to feel this is some magical or mystical moment in the sales process where the angels start to sing, everything's aligned and you ask for the business. Well, the truth is if you've done a great job following this process and you've been very attuned to your prospect, closing is just a natural part of the equation. They'll be ready for you to ask the question. It's really no secret why you're there. <laughs> you're there to talk to them and they know that. So let's ask for the business. Yeah, the, this is this is really powerful stuff. I'll tell you. Thank you. Um, how, how would you say? How would you describe in your own words how exactly the selling formula helps businesses cultivate a more efficient sales approach? the The fact that you've got a framework is the helpful part that creates efficiency. So if you just take your current selling process and plug it into those five uh, steps and use that as the framework for which you analyze your sales process, that creates efficiency in and of itself. And it also allows you to, to hone in on when somebody's having a challenge in their sales approach. Oftentimes I've discovered, as you've probably seen Steve over the years, there isn't generally a major glaring issue with the selling process of somebody. It's just a simple question they forgot to ask or they're, they're not honing their questions just right where they create the kind of interest and capability for somebody to say, yeah, I'm interested in what you're offering. Um, and this process, these five steps allow a company, if you again, plug those components in to that process, they allow them to become much more efficient and if they evaluate it based upon those steps. Um, in, in one of the bonus chapters of the book, it, it kind of jumped out at me and I thought, I thought everyone should know about this. Um, you talk about the top 10 power phrases that sales reps should be using right now. Can, can you go over these real quick and, and, uh, and I guess any, any, any thoughts on why any of them are really important or powerful? Sure. I'll, I'll share two of my favorite ones. Um, one of my very favorite is would the question, would you be opposed? Would you be opposed to finding out how we do X? Would you be opposed to meeting with me next Tuesday at 10 o'clock? Most people's natural tendency is to say no. So when you say no to that question, you're actually saying yes. <laughs> and so the psychology of it works in your favor. Because nobody likes to oppose things. Right. And with the second one, which is a great thing to say prior to would you be opposed, is the, the two words, I'm curious. I'm, I'm just curious. Steve, I'm just curious. Would you be opposed to us getting together next Tuesday for no more than five minutes so we could chat about what we're doing with hundreds of other businesses just like yours? And <laughs> the, the curiosity is, it's like a servant. It's taking and setting yourself in a, in a position where you're actually humbling yourself and you truly are curious and you're wondering, would you be opposed? 
And it does something in someone's psyche to hear that, I think. Yeah, and it makes I love calm. it. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite words is, uh, would it be appropriate? What phrase is it? Would it be appropriate or, because everybody likes to be appropriate. Like, <laughs> <good>. <laughs> would it be appropriate for us to discuss uh, this? Or, you know, like, yeah. would, would it be appropriate to talk about this next step? Or, yeah, you know, it's like uh, people like to agree to the word appropriate. And I think they like to disagree with being opposed. It's very, yeah. it's very similar. It's like, nobody wants to be an opposer. No one wants to do inappropriate things. Like, right. Right. <laughs> That's a great one. It, do you yeah. have any? Do you have any other phrases? Those are fantastic. Um, with your permission, is a, is another great one. <clears throat> before asking to pencil and a time, before asking whatever, with your permission, what I'd like to do is connect with you next week as a follow up uh, at ten o'clock. Would you be opposed to that? Yeah, that's that's those are. I love it. That's another great one. Um, any others you wanted to add? You've got to get the book to get the rest. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, uh, well, you've definitely wet my whistle. Uh, so what's the, uh, what's the fastest way somebody can double their sales right now? You know, this is uh, <laughs> what I recommend is you find your top two or three salespeople. If you're in a sales organization, of course, and record their live sales calls and then review those and see which one has the most duplicatable process. Who's the most consistent in implementing it? Because you've got some sales leaders that are just really hard to follow. They're just, they have the skill and ability to kind of weave and dodge that's different from other salespeople in some cases. Mm -hmm. right. So if you can find somebody who's consistent and then listen, listen to that at least 25 times. For example, I have a gentleman that I worked with who um, I gave him a copy of my sales discussion for a particular product. He listened to it about 50 times. He could, he could spit it out verbatim. Um, and he doubled his sales and became the uh, number one salesman for the company. And it was just a matter of owning the language, owning the steps, and following through and just duplicating it. And I'm not suggesting that you eliminate your personality or anything like that. But just like a actor who's great at delivering their lines, there's some critical uh, need for that. And pausing and the way you phrase things, just like we talked about key selling phrases, those are kind of the things you'll see the top salespeople use over and over and over, and it works really well. So just duplicate that. Great advice. How can salespeople generate more leads without cold calling or doing cold drop-ins? The... The best way I've discovered is through a very simple direct mail process to a landing page. And you can do this literally printing your own letters at, in your home office if you want, um, or you could do it in a much broader fashion. What I've discovered is the direct mail approach, if you use hand-addressed direct mail where it looks like it literally is hand-addressed and you put a note inside the letter, and then you have a single call to action. Go to this, if you ever, if you ever struggled with X, and I, I give an example of this, um, if you go to the sellingformula.com, you can download my lead generation process that I'm explaining in detail. But um, direct mail piece, hand addressed envelope and hand addressed um, note or handwritten note on the letter, directing them to a specific landing page that has a URL that ties to the problem that your client or prospect, potential client or prospect is experiencing, go to that, maybe have a one to three minute video and a call to action to respond to you. And that has given us over the years a five to one, 10 to one, 12 to one um, ROI. Every time we do a direct mail to our target market following this approach, that's the return on investment we tend to get. So there's some very specific things you'd want to do to follow through on that. And again, I outline that in that particular document. Very cool. Um, when it comes to closing the sale, what do you think the most important thing is to keep in mind? Um, I kind of mentioned this a little earlier, and that is, this again, is not some magical or mystical moment 
in the sales process. If you've done your job, if you followed the, the steps, you should expect that your prospect will say yes to a simple question. And um, one of my favorite questions, um, closing questions that changed everything for me was, if I could, would you? And oftentimes, of course, you get a little hesitation. And the question is, if I could offer you some incentive to go ahead and move forward now, as opposed to later, would you be opposed to hearing about it? So you're not actually offering the incentive, you're asking them if they'd be open to hearing about the incentive. And that was a game changer for me. It's probably a question a lot of the people listening to this already use in some mm -hmm. form or fashion. But um, if you ask permission to make some kind of an offer, sometimes they'll say, no, we're, I don't care what your offer is. I've had people say this. Um, it, it won't matter, Brian. <laughs> I'll say, okay. Most people would just out of curiosity will want to know what the offer is. And that will generally give the opportunity to get a deal done. That's been my experience. Very cool strategy. Um, what do you think the number one reason people, what the, what the number, num, what is the number one reason that people don't close more deals? I think it's because that they haven't asked the appropriate questions. They haven't done their due diligence up front in building out interview questions that are really get down to the true needs of their prospect. And they're, they're probably more focused on themselves and being able to get that deal done as opposed to the individual they're sitting in front of. If, and my, my suggestion would be if you're struggling with closing sales, I would look at the questions you're asking and then ask yourself a real heart question. Where are you focused prior to your sales conversation and where are you focused during the conversation? Are you there to really help your prospect fulfill a need or are you really just thinking about getting that deal done? Uh, you can put your prospect can sense if you're there to talk about things because it's all about you as opposed to them. They can pick up on it very simply and it just works against you to be focused on yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it makes a ton of sense. I mean, that, that's well, the, the next section of the, of the show here is what I call sales in 60 seconds. And uh, I'll, I'll just ask you a question and we'll try to get through the answer in 60 seconds. Okay. Um, what have you found to be the key challenges that salespeople face when it comes to selling? First of all, their thoughts about their prospect, whether they're focused on their prospect or not. Secondly, again, their questions are critical and taking good quality notes. And thirdly, we didn't talk about this, having really good stories about how your prospects have used your product or service because stories sell. People truly uh, connect themselves in their mind to the stories that you tell, which helps you close more deals. And what's the greatest sales lesson that you've ever learned over the years? The greatest sales lesson I've discovered is that you could be literally one question away from dramatically changing your entire sales outcome. It's not always, you don't need generally a wholesale change in everything you're doing. It's usually just one question that you didn't ask or one closing thought you could have given that can tend to shift everything. So I would suggest looking at kind of the, the, key, the key here is where do you tighten up in your selling process and then hone in on where you feel that lack of confidence or your tightening and that's the that's going to be the, the place where you'll discover the answer as to what you need to do to change. Yeah, that, that actually overlaps with probably one of my greatest sales lessons, and that's um, to ask the questions that allow you to understand the value that your product or service brings to the decision maker, both, you know, not only from a business perspective, like, oh, if I buy this for $10,000, our company's gonna make another $20,000 a year, so this is worth an extra, it's worth $10,000 to us in profit every year. Um, but, but also politically within the organization and personally for that decision maker, like understanding, hey, if this goes really well, what does it mean to that person? 
and mm. their career and um and then kind of being able to understand that so you paint the right picture of and can really speak to well this this is what this is going to do here's mm -hmm. here's, how, here's how we're going to make you a hero basically yeah um, that's great so uh, what what uh what factors hold people back from becoming truly great at selling it's we've kind of this has kind of been the theme i think it's really being self-focused instead of being client or prospect focused uh, if you're so focused on how you're doing your selling process which is normal when you start sales if you've never sold before that's totally normal but the faster you can get beyond that and especially if you're a seasoned salesperson um, it's critical to me that you really take some time to like and care in your heart about your prospect before you ever sit down with them. It, and, and part of that too is something matching and mirroring, matching their vocal pace, their volume, their, their um, body language, their breathing. Those types of things can also create such great rapport. If you're focused on your prospect, and you do those things in addition, there is a likability and a trust factor that just exponentially increases if you do those things. And that will change your sales outcomes, providing that you've got, again, great questions. Um, on, and on the flip side of that question, what would you say is the, the number one key to becoming great at selling you know, the way you describe in your book? I think it's look at your sales process now and goes back to the concept of look at where you're tightening up. You know intuitively where you're, where you're challenged right now in your selling process and then be brutally honest with yourself and hone in on that feeling. Why are you feeling that way? What's causing that? And then go to that, that space and see what you need to shift, what question you need to ask, what training you may need that will allow you to overcome that feeling and become confident. And that should help you overcome that hump and change your sales uh, to the extent that it grows everything for you. What's one important idea or top piece of advice that you would like to give our listeners? Um, again, you're, you're one, potentially one question away in your sales process of changing your entire outcome. One question can make all the difference in your selling process. So I would uh, go, go back and look again at how you're asking and what you're asking and how sincerely you're asking those questions. Mm. And uh, as a final takeaway, what should the field salespeople listening today do as a first step to implementing the selling formula that you've outlined and these getting these five steps into their sales process? Um, two things. First, you can get the first three chapters of this book for free, downloadable um, audio chapters. Just go to brianrobinsonbook.com. And then you can also go to the sellingformula.com to get the free downloads for the lead generation process and some other items that are part of the book. But start, I would start with listening to the first three chapters, brianrobinsonbook.com. And then if you think it makes sense, you can pick the book up. That's awesome. Um, not many authors do that. That's pretty cool. Um, so, well, the, the, uh, the final, the, the, what I do next here is I'm going to try to summarize what we've talked about today. Um, and kind of try to crystallize the different, the different thoughts that we've had. For, for all our, our listeners, since a lot of them are driving and stuff, it's good to hear things twice since you can't take notes. Um, so to summarize what we've talked about today with Brian, his book, The Selling Formula, lays out five specific steps that you need to take throughout the sales process. First, connect and set the agenda. Second, the interview process. Third, presenting your solution. Fourth, pricing and guarantees, and finally, closing the sale. For the first step, when you connect with the prospect, you need to have a pre-call mindset that is focused on them and not you. When you set an agenda, make sure you and the prospect are on the same page 
and know what to do next. During the second step, the interview process, it's crucial which questions you ask and in which order. This can make or break the deal and this is the most important step. You can build your list of questions by looking at your products, the product's features, and then looking at the benefit each feature brings, and then draft questions based on those benefits. Your questions need to elicit the benefits of your product from your customer's perspective. Make sure you take specific quality notes from the interview and use them when you talk about your solution in the next step. This shows that you listened and that you can map your product to their needs. For step four, having three price points increases your chances of closing a deal. It gives people some options, but not too many, and this seems to be the magic number. This is actually, uh, you know, Brian, I'm glad we're taking your advice over here at Badger. We have like our, <laughs> We have our introductory product, and then we have, uh, you know, which is kind of like a taste of the product. It does some of the things that the full product does. And then we've got the, you know, the, the regular product for 35 bucks a month. And then we've got like an enterprise class version of the product that you only need if you're like, you know, a, you know, a medium size or large company. So we, we're doing that, you know, good, better, I call it good, better, best. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, it is really helpful because it kind of, you know, kind of gives people the high and the low, the basic, the, the full featured, and then most people land in the middle. Yeah. Um, so in the final stage, closing the deal will become a natural next step when you've done the pre previous steps right and ask the right questions. So this five-step formula can help you and your team create a clear framework that helps you work more efficiently and overcome challenges more easily. Brian also mentioned a few power phrases that you should start using in sales conversations. The first one starts with, would you be opposed to, that would be uh, like, would you be opposed to finding out how we do X or would you be opposed to meeting with me next week to go over Y? Um, another great power phrase, I'm just curious. Um, another one was, with your permission, and that's uh, another powerful phrase you can use with, uh, with a prospect. One trick that Brian recommends to every sales manager or rep is to record the sales conversations of the top sales reps in your organization or team. Then you truly listen to it several times to learn from that and apply it to your own conversations. Figure out what phrases they're turning. How are they asking questions? What are those questions? Handwritten notes addressed to your prospect with a single call to action can be really, really powerful. Uh, just you know, send them to a landing page from that note that talks about their particular problem, and that'll get them to uh, to act on it. Finally, look at your sales process right now, and think about what the critical steps are and where you don't feel totally comfortable and think you need some improvement. A lot of times it's just one question that you didn't ask or one step where you were missing some little piece that makes a huge difference in your sales success and changes the entire outcome. So Brian, this has been fantastic advice. Where can readers read more about your work and where can they reach out to you? Uh, you can grab the book at Amazon, The Selling Formula. Um, again, if you wanna listen to the first three chapters, just go to Brian Robinson book.com and then uh, you'll be steered in the right direction after that and you can reach out to me directly at brian b-r-i-a-n at the selling formula.com well, we all need to read more here's uh here's our chance let's do this <laughs> well i hope you guys have all enjoyed this episode of the outside sales talk if you have any feedback or suggestions feel free to ping us at feedback at outside sales talk.com if you like the podcast, subscribe, leave us a review. Helps us spread the word and get, uh, get this knowledge out to more outside salespeople. Take care and uh, talk to you next week. <laughs>